Thank you. Um, to start with, that's just a very nice intro introduction. I always get these very sort of detailed introductions when I when I um, start to speak somewhere, but. I'd li like to add something. I'm not going to details of my academic career, but I'll add the fact that I'm 36 years old. Why does this matter? Because mathematically, anyone who's 36 years old grew up as a politically conscious person in the 1990s, right? And the 1990s, as it happened to be, was perhaps the most dull decade in leftist thought. So always when I reflect on sort of large ideas of leftist thinking, I have to explain this background that anyone who became adult 18 years old in 1995 started to think about politics and social justice and things like that in general came from a kind of leftist void, right? Leftist nothingness. You might recognize that in Slovenia too, I believe. But this is also a starting point to talk about the ecological crisis in the context of capitalism. This is a starting point for any project of trying to think in terms of the political left. Because somehow we have to start from the reflection that what killed the left in the 1990s no, it wasn't that, that the Soviet Union failed. It wasn't that leftist parties would have lost their power. Leftist parties, social democratic parties, socialist parties are quite popular in many countries. In Finland, still in the 1990s, the left parties got a vote of 40%, no problem. Right? Still today, you know, there's, there's no problem with having, you know, political left or institutions which call themselves left using political power. The, the main problem is though that at that point somehow the left lost its vocabulary. For a quite some time, the left had maintained a tradition of speaking differently than the political right. The analysis was different. The whole way of describing social reality was different. Of course it was based on Marxist terms. Marxism used to be an alternative description of the, of, of the world, social world, to the liberal theory, combating the liberal theory, saying that we have a better description. Now, what happened to some 15, 20 years ago, was that Marxism was out of fashion. So what happened to the left was that we started to talk, or the left started to talk in liberalist terms, but with a leftist flavor, right? Not any more leftist terms, but liberalist terms with a leftist flavor. And that's most manifest in noting how the left shifted from using nouns to using adjectives. The leftist nouns used to be something like capital, class, struggle, exploitation, mode of production, and so on. And we shifted that to uh, leftist adjectives, right? Taking words like uh, liberalist words like trade, development, right, and adding, adding nice leftist adjectives before them. Fair trade, human development, social right, okay. So what happened to the left? We started talking adjectives in front of liberal nouns. And that's one of the biggest ideological defeats which ever happened to, to the left. We lost our nouns. This sounds might, might as I've seen, but to me, this was a revolutionary defeat, losing the nouns we, we used to use. And, you know, t today it's, it's very hard to hear even talking about public. 
You know, there, there's no, there, 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 there's really little talk about public as a common. There's more talk about um, social service provision. That, 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 that's, that's very liberal vocabulary. Even the EMU has now a social dimension. The left has become kind of a social dimension of contemporary capitalism. And we have to sort of start from this main concern we're starting to think how are ecological concerns framed today and how they could be framed given a leftist or, let's be frank, Marxist vocabulary. Right? Because ecological concerns have become something of, a, of the main um, terrain of ideological struggle, where liberalist concepts are most fiercely pushed as representing something good, necessary, responsible, which <coughs> is the field of, of ecology. So somehow we're constantly faced with concepts like green growth, or we're told that the green and the left are in, in some kind of conflict. And we sort of have to to um, try to look beyond those concepts and ask what would be a leftist description of the ecological crisis. Okay, what, what's an ecological crisis? I'm talking about ecological crisis, and it's fair to ask why crisis. Clearly, there's difference between problem and crisis, right? We can list ecological problems. A polluted lake is an ecological problem. Uh, running out of certain uh, raw materials, it's an ecological problem. Uh, too much carbon emissions, it's an ecological problem. Now, an ecological crisis is an event where these overlap. You cannot talk about individual problems anymore. You're facing something of um, systemic meltdown a sort of forced turning point of a system. So, as much as the liberal theory would like to present all ecological problems as individual problems, temporary short shortage of particular resource, which can be, um, which, which can, can be somehow replaced by another resource, or shortages of particular sinks, absorptive capacities. There seems to be something more all-encompassing about the ecological crisis. Now, crisis, of course, if we think etymologically, it comes from the same Latin root as critique, and in many Latin languages, from the same root as crisis, as um, as, as a um, acute uh, sickness or right, like a heart attack. What would be heart attack in French? Crisis cardiaque, right? That crisis is something which is <coughs> um, acute, and calls for critique, and. So there's a reason, I, I believe, why we should be talking about ecological crisis. So we need more sort of layered concepts of critique, and there's something very acute going on, and also we cannot face the ecological problems of today by merely leasing problems. We have to know that there's a simultaneous shortage of resources, all kinds of resources, sinks, I mean absorptive capacities, Right? Um, a lake can be a sink to the extent that it can hold a certain number of pollution before dying off. Right? Or the climate is a sink to some extent. It can absorb some amount of CO2 emissions before it starts overheating. Right? And so we're running out of resources and sinks simultaneously. <clears throat> so that, 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 that's a situation which is sometimes called peak everything. Right? You know the peak oil theory. Peak oil theory says that there's a certain 
point where un until which oil production increases and that's the peak oil and after that it's forced to decrease as there are ever less um, oil resources and there's also speculation are we is, is the world already past peak oil but then what's, what's more interesting is the peak everything theory there's just too much um, different kinds of resources used to the peak so that we cannot any more shift from one resource to another and at the same time also natural sinks are running out. So there seems to be some very general crisis of the nature relation of the production mode we live in. And coupled with the financial crisis it seems to extend to something of a general crisis of contemporary capitalism we, need, we, we seem to need some kind of limits to production and consumption and these limits seem impossible to impose <coughs> within capitalism, right? Because there's an inbuilt tendency for accumulation in the system we live in. So, somehow, if we take the ecological challenges the world is facing seriously enough, talk in terms of serious crisis, we seem to sort of run short of descriptive capacity when talking liberal concepts. It's very hard to take liberal theory and explain the ecological situation we live in. <coughs> but of course, there are lots and lots of different attempts. <coughs> and my idea was to briefly discuss four possible uh, solutions provided by um, some kind of mainstream or Keynesian or non-leftist um, thinkers as solutions to the ecological crisis. So after that, I may move on to sort of start, start to sketch my description or what, what I hold to be some, somehow better. Now of course to, to start with the most naive one of all is consumer awareness. This is what we typically hear when we, when we say that there are ecological problems, um, the world is heating, according to some projections already by the turn of the century, the world might be six degrees hotter than today. We don't know if there's going to be any life left on the planet under these, under these conditions. The answer would be in light consumers. Um, of course, that's not very prom promising, but that's the sort of strongest mainstream answer there is, or, or the sort of most audible mainstream answer. Wherever you start talking about ecological problems, you hear the, the main, main claims that when people simply start to demand more eco-efficient products from the market, there will be a mirac miraculous change to a more sustainable system. Now, this is of course based on the very basic idea of neoclassical economics where everything significant is placed on the act of consumption. If, if you think of neoclassical economics as an ideology, the main point always is that all well-being, all communication, all social relations, they are embedded in and only in the <coughs> instance of consumption. No matter where you work, how's, how's your work life, what kind of political common, common goals you desire, what kind of social <coughs> relations you prefer, when you go to the supermarket, you, you 
show what your well-being and political and social desires consist of. And it of course sounds really, really silly when said like this. But show me a neoclassical economics textbook which is not based on, on this main premise. The, the very idea of neoclassical economics has always been that in the act of consumption, people show their preferences, they have formed in their mind a list of preferences, and by showing how much money they're willing to use to pay for some, for some product or service, they will um, show how much they value it. And putting that all together, let's call the market, they neatly um, combine into something of optimal preference satisfaction. Now this is the investment economy as true ideology. But of course, that ideology becomes very, very strong when brought into the <coughs> ecological concerns. The well-being theory of neoclassical economics turns into, a, into also a theory of responsibility. It's pointing at consumers and saying that whatever ecological concerns might be, they are on your personal responsibility as a consumer. At the last time. Um, and so, so we, 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 we end up having a theory simply nothing about um, anything like motor production, anything about crisis and post-crisis politics, and so on. We have to note always when we uh, talk about mainstream <coughs> economics or neoclassical economics, we have to note that it's a fundamentally conservative system of thought. Right? It's based on the idea that nothing in the social equi equilibrium ever changes. Right? That was based on the, uh, on the old Newtonian mechanics, uh, where the universe, the whole existence, was modelled as pieces pulling each other harmoniously to different directions. Right? So everything was in balance, everything was in equilibrium. The mindset of neoclassical economics has never tolerated conflict or even change for that matter. And it's serious, serious change. So when, when, when modeling e e economics, of this harmonious Newtonian universe, econ economists start are asking questions like, now, if the price of bananas increases by 10 cents, will, how many people will prefer apples? And take these kinds of questions as serious economic analysis. Well, it's not very serious economic analysis to, to my mind, but that's the very core of that kind of thinking. And now, when turned into um, ecological politics, the very idea gets the form of how much does the price of oil need to increase for consumers to prefer something else. And of course, that's not the question. We live in a civilization based on oil and civilization and an economic system based on accumulation. Consumer preference for oil, given any marginal price increases or decreases, is really not even trying to answer the, the, the actual question. Now, the, the second strategy often um, suggested as a solution to ecological problems, is what's called the immaterial term. Right? This is very, very popular. At least in Finnish politics, whenever anyone tries to say there's an ecological planetary crisis going on, 
the immediate reply will be, oh, we need the strong immaterial term, right? The immaterial term means simply an idea that, that there, there needs to be less productive economy and more what's called green economy, that services, culture, and, and all that. Then, of course, quite a few people have their doubts about will that kind of immaterial economy ever actually replace material and energy in intensive um, economy. It's very when you want to believe that. And there's, of course, all kinds of fashionable uh, social scientist literature about the creative class and all that. You know, the image of of the um, IT millionaires riding their bike and only consuming on their neat MacBook. You know, that's kind of sort of new green image. It's really ruling their, their social imagination. Now, each time I start to actually ask ask myself, what does the immaterial term consist of? Thinking examples. These examples are something completely different. Or say, or, or in the mode of, why would anyone want the immaterial term? Right? Well, the immaterial term really consists of. Uh, some five years ago, the, the um, American author Doug Henwood started to dig into the thesis that service industry is the uh, sort of most eco efficient increasing system within the within the US economy. Right? Produces more most immaterial value added. And Doug Henwood is the editor of Left Business of <coughs> Observer. That, that, that's a brilliant magazine in turn right. And what what Henwood found out was that the one key explanation of a key single sector where was the immaterial value added coming from in the US economy were Walmart's workers. And they were producing so much value added, of course, because they were underpaid. You know, Walmart, the supermarket chain. Because Walmart, the supermarket chain, isn't really paying its workers anything. There's lots of immaterial value added produced. Now further, I myself started to, to look at um, statistics within Finland. What's the, what's the biggest single sector of, um, of services? Immaterial, nice, green, new economy. That turn out, turns out to be international tax avoidance. You know, accounting firms making huge companies, uh, gi giving huge companies accounting services so that they can pay their taxes to the Bermudas rather than Finland. That's like in the key of the service sector, right? Um, but what, what, what else? What else? Eh? In, in, in material economy also needs uh, patents. You know, do, do we want patents on life-saving medicines or closing down free software, whatever? If 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 you if you want to create an immaterial economy, you want to force relations of ownership to spheres of life where such ownership structures haven't haven't uh, previously existed. So, so you, you're curious to find people criticizing what, how the US government forces patents on life-saving medicines or these horrible processes of patenting human genes or, or biopiracy in India and whatever. And at the same, same time saying that we need an immaterial term. When, when, when we live in a capitalist economy, immaterial term consists of exactly these things. Moving into um, 
underpaid service jobs and somehow forcing the relations of, of ownership to ever new spheres, right? So I'm, I'm not that optimistic about immaterial return on. Now, getting get into more radical stuff, if ever more people seem to seem to favour some kind of degrowth strategy nowadays. Now, degrowth movement is getting big. Degrowth simply means a strategy of decreasing or status of the GDP, saying that um, instead of the production growing, what we need is to stabilise it because growing production always implies growing ecological damages and we don't need growing production or we can't afford growing production for that reason. It would just cause too much, too much uh, ecological damage. That's, I mean, very sensible if you just say it as an argument not touching any social relations of any sort. But now then, why not say, say anything about productive <coughs> relations or financial relations? What seems quite clear is that degrowth strategies come in very, very many forms. The current financial capitalism is a degrowth strategy. Of course it is. It destroys economic value. When you let financial capital rule the system, it will lead to increasing profits in the expense of production. There's ever less invested in production and ever more of the value added going to uh, adding capital. So, in a way, present financial capitalism produces a degrowth de strategy. It's just a horribly bad one. It's very unjust. It's hugely unstable. Hugely unpredictable. It polarizes wealth on a massive scale, on an unprecedented scale. It's if you just want degrowth, that's degrowth, right? So, for that reason, I'm not quite sure why I care about the GDP so much. Clearly, I see a reason to care about the environment, but the GDP can pretty much reflect anything. Quite clearly, the GDP can, can grow by production of food or arms, and it can decrease by the decrease of production of food or arms, to be very sort of simple. But also we have to understand the GDP not as a pro GDP growth, not as a process in itself, but as byproducts of capitalist accumulation <laughs> in certain conditions. GDP growth grows when capitalist accumulation is directed so that there will be more productive investment. So I have my, my doubts on the on the degrowth <coughs> strategy as well. Of course the, the next sort of or the other very popular kind of more radical strategy would be the green Keynesian strategy. And the followers of, of John Maynard Keynes are, are, are very keen to, to point out that theoretically we could achieve <coughs> full employment in uh, conditions in which ecological investment is added to the system. The state uh, government would undertake investments in new energy production and distribution, building railroads and all that. Right? Temporarily, that could create some environmental solutions, but it would leave the existing capitalist relations quite intact. And as we know, there would be necessarily a rebound effect on the accumulation regime as long as the strategy counts on the continued existence of the accumulation regime the very accumulation regime being in crisis because of the environmental situation, 
the strategy might only be temporary at its best. Now, I already referred to main problems of neoclassical economics, and I do think we need to understand the worldview of neoclassical economics to be able to criticize that kind of worldviews, because they're very, very powerful in shaping the social imagination. We have to understand the very, very specific understanding of well-being, which is part of neoclassical economics. We have to understand the three ideas of marginalist economics, equilibrium, valuing continuity over conflict, the, 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 the sharp conservatism embedded in the whole point of view, and therefore the tendency to interpret any ecological problem as a pricing problem. Right? Problem with prices it can be fixed with fixing prices. But now, as a sort of more interesting and to my mind more viable alternative, starting from some kind of Marxist interpretation, would be to start from two key Marxist analytical ideas. Now, of course, it's wrong to say that, that there are two certain Marxist ideas or modes of analysis which are somehow above others. Because Marxism is very rich theoretical tradition, there's very many uh, modes of analysis. But let me point to first, to understand the form of a society, we need to understand the form of how its social and productive relations are reproduced. Right? The Marxist point is to ask how does the society reproduce itself rather than what uh, kind of added value it, it generates from year to year. And so of course Marx himself analyzed how feudal societies reproduce themselves and how capitalist societies reproduce reproduce themselves. And of course the, the main point of, cap of capitalist reproduction is that it's reproduction based on growth, composition and growth. Right? For a sort of simple feudal society to reproduce itself, certain social relations need to be reconfirmed, learned, uh, some natural conditions have to prevail, some kind of agriculture has to take place, some kind of uh, some simple technology needs to be repaired, maintained, and so on. And of course, uh, new people need to be born in the society. But that kind of reproductions are quite simple and were part of, of any social order before capitalism. Now, in capitalism, the curious thing is that constant growth, accumulation, is part of the conditions of reproduction. To be able to reproduce itself, the society needs to grow. The cap capitalist society needs growth. Right? And that's what make, makes capitalism really peculiar and different from any previous uh, modes of, of production. And the, the, the other issue is that the form of society derives from its underlying re revolution. Right? What Marx really says about revolutions is not that revolutions destroy societies, they do that too, but that revolutions create societies. To understand any particular society or social form, you have to look at what particular revolution, what kind of revolution, started that society. Now, we, we tend to misinterpret what revolutions mean, because um, 
the social imaginary is so filled with actual uh, revolutions meaning overthrow of power, right? When we think of revolutions, we think about guerrilla storm the TV tower and that kind of images. Um, but for Marx, revolutions, I mean, of course, they can be that, but they're, they're very often also productive revolutions. An invention of turning key technology might imply a revolution, given that it uh, implies a similar change in social relations also. For example, it seems very sort of common social common you know commonplace sociology to talk about the Green Revolution. Green Revolution means when humanity started using more more machinery in food production. Food production became more industrialized. That's the, to me that's a very good Marxist way of using the concept of revolution. Green Revolution truly changed the reproductive logic of modern societies because ever more because ever less people are, are agricultural laborers and to some quite serious extent it's also transformed social relations right who has what kind of power over whom right and this seems to me to be a very interesting a key and sadly forgotten method of analysis of social forms. A very simple question, and what kind of revolution the particular social form came about? Um, and so, to ask how to get to an ecologically sustainable society, how to live in harmony with nature, if you like. We need to be asking, asking ourselves two questions. How can a society maintain um, to reproduce its ecological relations? And second, what kind of revolution particularly would be a revolution of sustainability? What kind of revolution would be needed to guarantee a sustainable and ecologically sustainable social form? And to, to ask the, the question of ecological sustainability in these terms, as you note, that's something very, very different to asking the question in terms of desired prices in functional markets as the new classical theory would, would, would like to present. And again, we can, and we should, understand revolution in a very, very wide manner. There are revolutions of all sorts. But somehow we need to ask what kind of revolution would be needed to start a sustainable social form Especially if we conclude that ecological crisis, as we know it, is crisis in such a serious dimension that it somehow is destroying the basic conditions of, pre of reproduction in the existing system. Before getting any further, I'd like to point out some points about expansion of capital and how the expansion of capital relates to this issue in hand. And particularly, what's been interesting to me is um, Rosa Luxemburg's theory of the accumulation of capital. Now, I'm, I'm sure this sounds odd to you. I mean, 
I always have problems explaining myself when referring to uh, Luxembourg as any kind of means of understanding ecological problems or problems of green society of that time. The accumulation of capital was written in 1913, 101 years ago. Because I, I, I think, think 100 years is, is a uh, good, good age for a book. It's a good age for, for a book in social analysis for the very reason that if something is analyzed correctly a hundred years ago, then the analysis must really touch the, the, the basis of the productive system we live in. Yeah. Capitalism has changed so much, transformed its existence so much in a hundred years, that if there's anything relevant to be found in Luxembourg's book, it really must touch some, something very essential in the form of capitalism. Now, Luxembourg's book is big. It's almost 600 pages in English translation. And it's really, really messy. When she, she wrote it, she didn't stop to edit it. She, she just wrote it in one piece. That's why most people never read it. It's really, really painful to read. But, but it, it's, it's immensely interesting. Um, <coughs> now, Luxembourg asks a very simple question from herself, which is like so basic for economics, it's strange that it's not that often asked. That is, for whom are the new products actually made for? produced in the economic system. Because, as Marx had, had analysed, capitalism has a tendency to grow. Capitalists ha have a tendency to accumulate and they invest all the time in order to keep the system growing. But why do they invest? Who, which buyers they have in mind when they invest in new production. Now, if capitalism would be a sort of a, a, a system of simple reproduction, like feudalism, there, 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 would, there would be no need for, for um, new investment. It would just reproduce itself quite simply. But it's not a system of simple food production, it expands. And for the capitalists to be willing to expand production, they have to anticipate someone to buy their products. Now Marx only refers to competition, but competition is not actually a very good answer to why capitalists want to grow their production. So whom are the new products made for? And at the same time, Luxembourg started being politically very active in the anti-imperialist movement, she was really concerned about the way European powers were conquering, especially Africa, at the time. So, simultaneously, she was thinking of why imperialism prevails. Now, it's really seen that Europe was doing something very, very different in Africa than it was doing 200 years earlier in South America. When, when Europeans invaded South America, it was about God, glory, and gold, right? It was a matter of you know, having a sort of divine justification to go and steal the gold of the Incas, right? But in Africa, something totally different was happening, something totally different. It wasn't run by these kinds of um, imperatives, it was run by capitalist economic imperatives. So it's got a totally new form. And, and, and Luxembourg figured that the form imperialism took in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, 
as a difference to the early imperialism in South America was because of uh, the capitalist pressures of accumulation, right? Capitalism needed geographical expansion. But it was not about raw materials, it was not, it, it, it was not about um, new uh, sources of gold or something like that. It was about demand, economic demand, right? The European capitalists didn't want to conquer Africa because of, because of gold or anything like that. They wanted to conquer Africa because they, they needed people outside the capitalist sphere of, of production to be the new purchasers of their products. Because no one within the capitalist sphere of production could actually afford them. Workers couldn't afford them. Capitalists couldn't be just uh, using all the surplus value they created. If they would, they wouldn't have any money left for investment. Right? And in those conditions, capitalists started find new uh, consumers for their products outside the capitalist sphere of production. And that, according to Luxembourg, where imperialist policy came in. The matter was how to force the so-called natural economy to have demand on capitalist products. On the correct currency, of course, a currency of money accepted by the capitalists. And the, the answer was something which is also very, very timely today, that's international lending. The capitalists used their accumulated surplus to lend money to new colonies so that the new colonies could consume the capitalist uh, production which couldn't be consumed within capitalist core. Right? That's, that, that, that's a very simple description of colonialism. It's a very interesting one because it really turns on its head our basic beliefs or the sort of history book narratives of why Africa was conquered. It was conquered for demand, right? To, to create economic demand and force loan on African continent. Now, of course, what happens when, when the, the African country takes loans? Of course, the loans bear an interest and it's the, the system falls apart very quickly. It's forced on, on ever tougher labour on the local peasants and so on and so on. But it's not a problem for, for capitalism. Capitalism move, moves ahead. When one country is fallen into this uh, system of forced loans, it's of course destroyed economically, capital can move to the next country, no problem. And so what Luxembourg was claiming is that capitalism is a lot smaller than, than Marx claimed. So it prevails in a very, very tiny piece of land, and especially in her time, in Central Europe. And capitalism would fall apart if it couldn't use areas outside capitalism to feed its own, own accumulation, this accumulation being a condition of reproduction. So capitalism can reproduce itself only as long as there are areas to which loans can be pushed to create demand for capitalist products. And this is a key difference to Marx. Marx thought of capitalism as more of a closed system. Luxembourg says that capitalism couldn't exist 
without these non capitalist terrains, which can it, which it can turn into its tool for accumulation. And, and for that reason also capitalism is not not similar everywhere. The capitalist cores and capitalist peripheries which are are used by capitalism. Further, the fact that capital is always seeking for these kind of new areas to exploit, there's a constant struggle going on at the borderlines of capitalism and natural economies. Because natural economies have no interest in capital, pro capital products or, or, or international loans if they're not forced. And, and, and that, that's where armies and colonial policies are needed. But of course, natural economies don't just see the army and surrender, there's a constant struggle in that, those kind of borderlines and outposts of capitalism. And of course, it might happen that capitalism is not successful in those kind of, of uh, borderline conflicts. And so Luxembourg's theory turns out it's a very interesting description of the constant attempt of capitalism to use these kinds of sort of peripheral areas one by one and constant struggle at this borderlines. Now of course Luxembourg thought that when all the countries have been used this way, there's no room for expansion for capital anymore. That Luxembourg thought would kill capitalism because there's no external area anymore to be exploited. Right? Then the, the conditions of free, pro, free production are over. But there it seems that, that, that she was wrong. And this is where we get back to the so-called pre-economy after this curious detour in a century-old socialist theory. Now getting back to why I was speaking about Luxembourg in Luxembourg's theoretical conception at this point. Because I do believe that the so-called green economy, what's being pushed to the system all the time, the green economy, the immaterial economy and so on, can be interpreted in Luxembourg's terms as a new area of exploitation. So Luxembourg was conceptually very, very good, but where she, where she seemed to have gone wrong is that such new terrains, which can be used by capitalism, are not just geographical. They can be of any form. They can be cultural. Capitalism is still a very, very small area in the world if we don't think in terms of geography, but we think in terms of social logic. Um, most of the things we get and do and enjoy and how we interact with each other, they have nothing to do with capitalist logic. But slowly and surely, also these terrains are brought to the to the field or to the terrain of capitalism, and at some sort, this seems to imply that accumulation must be over. And the green economy seems seems to me to be one perfect example of such a process. How the green economy turns out to be a collection of forcing ownership structures, such as patents, into areas of life which used to be based on social interaction by a very, very different logic. Maybe some kind of communal logic, uh, sharing logic. The very green economy becomes actually very cl close to Luxembourg's description of what was done to the colonies. It's a capitalist outpost, right? And perhaps we should also be able to see it 
in Luxembourg's term as a similar outburst of struggle. If we take any sort of new means of communication, I mean, take, take the internet. Nothing is more communist than the internet, right? The internet was fully based on, based originally on free cooperation, anyone contributing as much as, much as they, they will, and anyone using it as much as they wish, right? Totally, I mean, fully uh, socialist project. And then, of course, part of the green economy is trying to make profit out of the functions of the internet, which means making very, very um, t taking a lot, a lot of effort to actually block people entering some sites without paying and so on. Or a lot of cultural products seem to be, be uh, based on mutual cooperation, free use. Now they're, they're, they're forced into patent structures. Even the atmosphere is being commodified. Right? What, what, what does, does carbon, carbon emission, emission trade system, cap and trade system mean? That's commodification of, of, of the climate itself. Um, so new areas of exploitation are not only geographic, but also cultural. And the, the very self new and bright green economy, which is unfolding before our eyes, can be seen as not an economy transforming itself into a more sustainable one, but a new area of forced capitalist relations with new areas in geographic sense are over. Almost all countries in the world are brought into that same system of, of um, accumulation. <coughs> and as in all capitalist expansion, government power is needed in the process. Government power in legislation, use of force if necessary. And so on. And this all is also a matter of creation of demand. The so-called green economy is not um, decreasing consumption by, by any means. Quite on the other hand, it's creating new social necessities, things we have to consume. The, uh, the counter develop, de development intellectual, even Illich, had a co quite a, a wonderful concept in the 1970s the radical monopoly, right? Now, what's a radical monopoly? I mean, a a mono monopoly is in a situation when, say, if you want a cola drink, the only alternative is Pepsi. That's a monopoly. A radical monopoly would be that if you want to ease your thirst, only alternatives are cold drinks. Right? That would be a radical monopoly. And Illich analyzed, for example, cars in Los Angeles as radical monopolies. They become necessities. It's not a monopoly of certain, it's not a monopoly of Volvo or Peugeot, but it's a radical monopoly of cars where you can choose what, what car you like but there's a radical monopoly of a certain form of transport. Now, this, this new green economy, or this communication, cultural uh, economy, it's a vicious system of creating ever new social necessities. Now, quite frankly, take the mobile phone. It's, it's very difficult to live without a mobile, mobile phone anymore. It's practically impossible. 
And, you know, be, being a Finn, I know something about the success of Nokia. I couldn't avoid that. Nokia, the mobile phone company. What was their strategy? It was never to be, it, 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 it was never to be superior to Ericsson or Samsung. It, it was not their strategy to win monopoly of mobile phones. It was always their strategy to make mobile phones a radical monopoly everywhere. Because that's the, that's the way they can, they can make most profits. Not being necessarily even ahead of their competitors, but to make their, their competitors' product a radical monopoly for practic you know, in, in practically any location on the planet. And so, so there, there we are with the, with the attempt to green the economy, produce more, more uh, culture, communication, and all that. And if we just take something of a Marxist perspective, the whole thing looks a lot different. It looks like a terrain of accumulation when old terrains of accumulation are running out. Desperate attempt to find new terrains of accumulation. Um, and this might give capitalism a lot of life. Capitalism is viciously good in finding these new terrains of exploitation. When geographic ter geographical terrains are over, move to cultural terrains, finance as such, you know, all financial speculation, it can be seen as yet another new, new um, the new terrain of accumulation. In, in finance, the terrain is time. Right? You, you commodify future expectations. That's yet another sort of um, area of new exploitation and, and accumulation. But at the same time, there's a real problem. At the same time, with, with capitalism, Capitalism, while it expands to new trains, it cannot live without its ecological basis. Right? It can extend to, to culture, communication, future expectation. It can create ever new social necessities, radical monopolies in these areas. But despite this expansion, it really cannot live without its ecological basis. Capitalism cannot survive a planet which is 10 degrees hotter than this. Capitalism is clever, but not that clever. And there are sort of very severe ecological constraints. And so it needs some you know, basic resources. Capitalism is also based on natural orders. So it needs some some resources to renew themselves. And it needs some natural sinks as dumping grounds for waste. So planetary ecology is the limit, and perhaps the only limit from which capitalism cannot escape. Even though its own conditions of reproduction must be preconditioned on constant accumulation, finding new terrains of demand, at the same time, in planetary means, ecological means, it necessarily destroys its own conditions of reproduction. Right? This is what, for example, John McMurtry has called the cancer stage of capitalism. It's, it starts to, um, to live in a stage in which its life implies killing itself. Right? Okay. Well, that's what the cancer stage is. So, th there seems to be a lot we can say about conflicts of capitalism, different um, perspectives to green economy, and I really urge people to be critical about issues like the green economy and, and to look at such issues in the context of capital accumulation. But now, 
To the end, I'd like to present a few strategies as possible ways forward. As you most certainly guessed <coughs> when I was talking about this some 15, 20 minutes ago, I have no answers to the question that what kind of revolution would be needed for a sustainable society. I wish I have some day that describing this exactly would have been possible, but that's something to think of. Um, being at the point where we are, we can only take some strategies as sort of preliminary ideas on how to proceed and what kind of tools of, um, of thought and action might provide some perspective forward in the search of um, both ecologically sustainable futures and social justice. Right. Now, the first strategy is something already implied by Luxembourg's work, and that's constant struggle at the outpost of capitalism. As we understand capitalism as constantly uh, expanding system of accumulation, but we know that it's nowhere wins without struggle. There's a continuous need for, for that, that kind of struggle in those key locations where capitalism is really sort of pushing itself forward most aggressively at any given time. Of course, we, all, we always have to um, analyze what, what would such outposts be, and that's not an easy task. There was a long debate some two, three years ago about the Pirate Bay. You must remember the Pirate Bay. It was the sort of Swedish website where you could mm -hmm. sort of download anything for free, right? And so the debate was, is Pirate Bay um, just a new form of capitalist profit making? Or is it actually anti-capitalist struggle at this outpost of capitalism called cultural patents? Right? You know, um, when the, the internet represents common use of free use by, by everyone, sort of baseline socialist logic, is part A possibly defending that <coughs> against capitalist attempt to move that into, again, one area of ownership relations and new demand caused by uh, you know, necessity to pay the owners of any content. And that, that, that's an open question. So we have to have, have to be intelligent and analytical about where such outposts of capitalism would be and what that struggle might consist of. But clearly, on different kinds of cultural commons, cooperatives, alternative economic systems, open software, free natural terrains, like nature parks, whatever, that's something which remains, or uh, those are things which remain or are created as cultural and natural commons. Commons not yet brought into the sphere of capital accumulation and private ownership. And they might be preserved that way. And, and, and that creates the perspective of sort of everyday struggle at such outposts. I mean, they believe that very simple alternative economic systems or engaging in peer-to-peer -peer production, open software movements and things like that can be actually seen as such um, struggle at such outposts. 
that's defending commons. So we have to, to ask ourselves, what are the ecological, cultural and temporal terrains which are analogous to colonies in Luxembourg's time? Right. And we, we have to, to bear in mind that commons exist naturally. Capitalism doesn't exist, capitalist logic doesn't exist as such if it's, if, if it's not turning commons into, sphere, in, into the, the sphere of private ownership and ownership relations. Um, and clearly, if, if, you, if you look at sort of intellectual and political movements in Europe today, something under the theme of commons is becoming big, right? Somehow unifying, uh, protecting existing commons and new commons, um, new spheres of, of commons, sort of reinventing the common. To another strategy, I do think that we need to reinvent the economy of use value. Now, for, for those of you who have read Frank Marx, remember that one of key concepts or key distinctions in Marx's economics was, is, is the, the differentiation between use value and exchange value, and explaining the, the, uh, the, the logic of, of capitalist economics. But now, for Marx, differentiating between use value and exchange value is only an analytical tool to explain how capitalist exploits workers. Right? But then, I do think that the concept of use value is also useful for reimagining the economy But not only as a description of exploitation, especially in times of ecological scarcity, this becomes crucial. When, when, when there's ever less resources to be used in the economy, we have to be clear on maximizing use value with the existing resources. Now, this, this comes down to the concept of eco-efficiency. What's eco-efficiency? Eco-efficiency is something you always hear when talking about ecological economics. Eco-efficiency means that you produce a product with as little raw materials and energy as possible. So if you say produce a washing machine and use only 50% of the energy and 50% of the raw materials and generate 50% less waste than your competitor, then you're twice as eco-efficient. Then, then your washing machine is twice as eco-efficient than the competitor's washing, washing machine. But the problem is that with this kind of kind of uh, definition of eco-efficiency, you're looking only at what's needed to produce a product, to produce a certain exchange value. You're not looking at what's needed to produce a certain amount of use value. And for that reason, if you have 10 people using the same washing machine, in terms of use value, that's more eco-efficient <laughs> and the washing machine used by one single household can never be. But the concept of eco-efficiency only focusing on exchange value can never grasp this um, fundamental aspect of what efficiency actually means. And therefore, for, for creating more ecologically sustainable economic systems, we have to get back to use value. Asking how much use value is produced by certain resources and certain energy inputs. And that also means 
reinventing the commons. The more people are actually benefiting mutually from something, the more efficient that is. And that kind of simple sort of Marxist tool, simple tool in Marxist theory, the distinction between use and exchange value, might sort of give us a totally different picture of what's ecologically efficient in an economy and what's economically wasteful, right? And that's the strategy. I'd like to remind that we, we live in financial capitalism. That is capitalism which is full of self-fulfilling events. Now, creating any kind of political change, you can use the self-fulfilling logic of contemporary capitalism. In financial capitalism, value is stored fundamentally not in money, but in collective psychological beliefs, meaning that if an enough large group of people think that something has no value, then it has no value. It turns out valueless. That's what you always find in financial panics and crises. You might have a stock of a company, which is the same company and as valuable as yesterday, but if overnight, because of some even single rumour, enough people start to think that the stock has no value, then it loses its value. The only thing which holds value of a product is mass psychology when we live in financial capitalism. Or like John Maynard, John Maynard Keynes described financial capitalism, it's like a gender, generalised third level beauty contest. In Keynes' time, the, um, the main English newspapers used to have this beauty contest. They had pictures of women and the task was not to pick the most beautiful one, but pick the one which the competitor thinks most people think the others think is most beautiful. Right? That's third level competition. And so, so Keynes used this as a metaphor of financial speculation as such. It's not that, that you think how valuable something is, but that you think what others might think that others think the value is. Right? And that's how value is generated and upheld in financial capitalism. And so pushing limits to this kind of system is easy. It's very easy. For example, if you want, uh, if humanity collectively wants to cease using existing oil reserves, what needs to be done? Legislating, pushing legislation, banning the use of existing oil reserves, it's very, very difficult. Trying to persuade companies, very difficult. What might be ever more easy, creating an atmosphere where most owners of oil company stocks actually think that the use of oil would be banned and that they would become worthless for that reason. So if enough many people think that oil will become worthless, it is worthless, right? That's how financial capitalism works. And now, of course, these three strategies have nothing in common, and they're sort of very preliminary starting points for any political project. But we have to start, start somewhere and have some future perspectives. Now, I'm sure I've used a lot more than my expected time, so I've finished here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, people, for this uh, wonderful and thought-provoking lecture. So, uh, right now it's time for the debate. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, please speak up.
a bit more. Uh, now, you mentioned commons and the need of uh, uh, leftist and progressive political uh, uh, organizations and groups of people to implement this as a new, uh, uh, let's say, uh, key concept for our uh, strategies in the future. Um, now, I would like to ask about Scandinavia in general, which we perceive as a uh, uh, rather progressive political scene. Um, why is it that even in such countries, for instance, you have separate uh, uh, groups of people of leftists and, for, uh, on the other hand, people battling for internet commons or for ecological commons? Why, why, why not even in uh, Sweden, for instance, Socialists and Pirate Party people are not uh, cooperating in the same kind of political project. I, I, I don't know about Sweden, but I mean that that might be changing. And at least what 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 I've noted in the Left Alliance, which is the, the party I belong to in Finland, um, it's a parliamentary party and it has lots of different tendencies, <coughs> but a lot of people working on different projects, especially peer-to-peer -peer production or new kind of cooperatives under the title of Commons, are very active in the party as well, bringing that also to the party agenda. So, I mean, that's, that might, might be that, that this situation is you know, evolving to, to be reality. Uh, now, of course, parties are old constructions. They are conservative. Any, any parties are, are conservative in, in, in their culture of operation. But I, 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 would, I would disagree with you. It's, it's not, not necessarily the case. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, on, on the same topic, uh, I'm working on a research project about sustainable development, the way it's reported in the press. Uh, also how uh, NGOs, activists and so on are um, conceptualizing it uh, and so on uh, and refers to uh, analysis of press reporting and uh, of course uh, all those uh, things that you mentioned you know, were, were dominant uh, also from uh, NGOs uh, educating people, responsible consumption and so on so, so I thought, my god, these people really believe that but then I did focus groups with uh, NGOs and it was completely the opposite picture. Everybody said, you know, we need systemic change, it's impossible to you know, continue within capitalism without totally devastating the environment. And that got me thinking, well, where is this coming from? You know, these totally two different uh, positions. And so uh, then I dug deeper and I found out that well, strategically uh, these uh, NGOs who do believe that radical change is needed, uh, what happens when the, when the government uh, develops a new uh, developmental uh, strategy? Where in Slovenia, the very first, uh, as the, the representatives of capital, what they think, they write something up and they give it into a uh, public discussion. So the environmental NGOs who don't really believe in those solutions, uh, then in that phase, uh, you not know, start to do compromises with this kind of rhetoric and uh, through, throughout time ever more and more of this neoliberal rhetoric is creeping into the documents um, of NGOs. Uh, so they're in this position then they feel that they need to at least achieve something and the price to pay for that to at least get something very small on the table is to accept uh, this ideological uh, framework. Uh, another thing is that, that they connect also on the European level in this uh, very fragmented group. So the environmental NGOs uh, are connected uh, within their groups and they do lobbying and so on. But again, the price for this, um, to get something through, uh, anywhere in, the, in this legislation, the other thing is to accept this broader ideological <coughs> um, framework. Um, so, so I guess a radical structure would be needed that enables uh, a radical anti-capitalist anti position to not only be proposed but 
that actually generates, uh, that has social power to, to uh, enact it. The, the, the word of NGOs, that, that's, you know, a whole story of its own. But I, I guess you find it everywhere that NGOs determined to have an impact have somehow adopted the idea that impact can be only made by adopting the existing rhetoric as thoroughly as possible because that's sort of generally accepted and they sort of want to push ideas from outside politics somehow. And, and, and a lot of NGOs don't think of you know, outside <coughs> politics as, as providing alternatives, but rather speaking the language of existing politics as thoroughly as possible. And that's, you know, what makes the NGO sector even a bit scary. I and mean, I've been mostly following global NGOs and the speed, how fast they've adopted these kinds of um, firm, friendly ideas like the global compact in the UN, that's, that's been totally shocking. I mean, NGOs used, used to be very critical about these, these um, same, same procedures. So, um, so somehow, I do think we have to dif differentiate between NGOs and civil society. NGOs want to call themselves civil society, but civil society is more about, uh, or also about spontaneous movements and not something organized essentially very close to power. 